we're going to introduce you to the concepts of environmental health in Health 214 um, course. And uh, my name is Arindam Basu. I am a senior lecturer at the School of Health Sciences at the um, University of Canterbury. And uh, this is my email address, arindam.basu at canterbury.ac.nz. And this is the best uh, way to contact me is to send me an email. Um, so what is this course about? In this course, we're going to learn five things. We are going to learn how we're going to understand environmental health issues. We're going to learn how do we investigate environmental health problems. We shall learn the very basic principles of environmental epidemiology to address health environmental health issues. And we're also going to learn some frameworks that are used to address environmental health um, problems. And one of the um, environmental health problems that we're going to learn is known as uh, the deep sea problem, the DPS, double E A. And at the end of this course, uh, you as a student, you're going to prepare a uh, environmental health related research proposal that we're going to examine. So let's get started. But um, so just a few words before we get formally started on the introduction to environmental health problem is this that um, the format of this course is based on um, providing lectures, online readings, and face-to-face -face participation. Um, the video lectures are uploaded on the Learn site as you're seeing this, and it is expected that you'll be listening to that lectures before coming to the class, and then you will be um, participating in the forum for the discussion of the week. And uh, the class is essentially built on face-to-face -face interactions, activities, and questions and answers and discussions. And then um, on Wednesday evening, I'm to host a or post a, um, a quiz that you will be taking. The cutoff date for each week's quiz is on Tuesday night. And then we also have a concept of bonus points, which means that any time that you participate in forum and write a substantial post, or you read the blog of the course and then you mark and then post additional comments, you qualify to get bonus points and these bonus points will add up towards your final grade for this class. So before much, uh, you know, without much ado, let's start looking at the concepts of environmental health, some of the concepts and contexts that we get to see. So what is environmental health? Well, environmental health very simply is just a study of health states that are brought about by our contacts or our encounter with environmental variables. And therefore, it is very important to understand what do we mean by environmental variables as well as health states. Note that environmental health and environmental epidemiology in particular is, um, is, is a rather old science. As early as in the 17th century, it was Bernardino Ramazzini, who was an occupational physician, he compiled the first lists of occupational diseases, occupational uh, induced diseases. Remember that this, in this course, we are not making much of a difference uh, by way of you know whether something is occupational or environmental, because occupation actually provides you with a very specific instance of environment. So um, we'll discuss occupational health as well, but in the spirit of an environmental health context. In about 1775, it was Sir Percival Pott, a prominent British physician, who discovered that among people who were who used to clean chimneys in those days, um, you know, of the smokestacks, um, the chimney sweeps they had they were they suffered from a particular kind of cancer, and that cancer was the cancer of the scrotum, and that had that was related to the suits that they were uh, they were cleaning up and their exposure to that particular environment. And uh, Sir Percival Pott published his study or his observations on the association between um, exposure to chimney sweep as, a, as an occupation and cancer of scrotum in 1775. Then in about the 19th century, John Snow's celebrated investigation of the London cholera epidemic was a landmark study. Um, and um, it really created a... a in the, one of the first beginnings of environmental epidemiological studies. So now let's start into the definition of environment in environmental health and we see that um, in general there are um, 
there are a few concepts that need to be understood. First of all, um, there is a dichotomy between genetic and uh, environment. So if you would think that by environment we mean that everything that is non-genetic, um, it may or may not be correct because um, while on the one hand it hugs back to the nature versus nurture debate, there are several other issues that are non-genetic but not strictly environmental as well, for example, lifestyle factors, somebody's habit of smoking, for example, or alcohol intake. Similarly, there are other environmental events such as natural disasters, for example, cold spells, earthquake, um, volcanic eruption. On these events, human beings do not have any control. And therefore, these are disasters and these are natural phenomena over which human beings do not have any control and therefore they do not come under the purview of environmental health either, not strictly. The third bit is sometimes there are individual issues, uh, but these again are not under the purview of environmental health. For example, nutritional aspects of diet over which people have got some, uh, you know, uh, you know um, may or may not have much control, but non-nutritional aspects of diet, that is food additives, that people can avoid, but they still consume. Passive smoking, for example, is an environmental health event. How? Because while active smoking is a lifestyle issue, passive smoking is when, you know, smoke or smoke particulates are um, are, are are present in the uh, in the ambient air that you inhale, over which you did not have any control, but um, um, you you are you are inhaling them but some other person, a human being, produced them. So you are exposed to which you do not have any control, but on the other side, there was another human being who produced those, those particulates. Likewise, exposure to dust and others, um, which are produced by human beings, um, to which people are exposed to, is also a matter of environmental health. Therefore, this leads us to the argument of healthy communities. Now, one of the important principles of environmental health is relates to healthy communities. And here the central argument is this, that each individual is responsible for his own health. And likewise, every, in, every individual has got a responsibility to make the community healthy. This should better be a lifelong effort. However, most communities are dispersed and people are dispersed and they live almost like in silos. So there is a need to connect the different kind of silos and create a movement so that we can create a healthy community. Also one of the principles of uh, environmental health. So here is a graphic of healthy community. As you can see that this basically gives you a, a holistic sense that, you know, uh, that as an environmental health professional, uh, one needs to be, a, one needs to cultivate leadership qualities uh, and, uh, you know, bind the, community together to shape its future and that that uh, you know uh, a vital economy a healthy natural environment and personal well-being everything is very very important so it's more or less multi-level you can see that on one level there is the human being on the other level there is a, a story of a community that needs to be connected to each other now one of the important sciences that we're going to discuss in this class is environmental epidemiology so it's a good point to learn about the role of environmental epidemiology in environmental health. Environmental epidemiology actually helps a lot in uh, particularly in environmental health risk assessment and environmental hazard assessment. Um, first of all, environmental epidemiological studies are used to identify the available environmental hazards. And then environmental epidemiological studies are also important to understand the risks that are present um, and characterize those risks. In other words, compared with people who are exposed to lower levels of hazards, people who are exposed to higher level of hazards, how much are their risk of developing a particular disease or disease conditions. As a result of this risk characterization, environmental epidemiology is also important to help setting priorities as to which ones should we uh, put most emphasis on to address so that the hazard is minimized. While epidemiological methods are very similar to almost all exposure, um, you know, all exposure uh, and, uh, you know, disease associations, in particular, what distinguishes environmental epidemiology in the context of environmental health is a special attention given to exposure assessment 
as a result of an environmental epidemiological study. We shall learn this in course of this, um, in, in, in due course. So to give a quick definition of environmental epidemiology, it is the study of the effect on human health of physical, biological, and chemical um, factors that are present in our external environment. Remember that environment in this particular setting is defined um, in the same way that we have defined um, bef before. That is, environment in the context of environmental health refers to um, that particular aspect of environment which is produced by another or human being or another set of human beings, but over which a person who is recipient does not have much control. One of the things that environmental epidemiologists do is that they study the contrast between existing diseases and what is expected. That is, in any locality or any place or any given point in time, some diseases are expected. If what we observe exceed the expected rates, then that is a matter of concern. And that's when uh, environmental factors are given a prominence. So environmental epidemiological context in environmental health indicates that there is an optimal analysis of potential public health consequences of suspect exposure. What that means is this, that when you, um, when you are suspicious that certain exposures are taking place in the community, then it is very important that um, the environmental epidemiologists would tell you as to what could be the public health consequences, or as an environmental health specialist, the potential public health consequences must be uh, clarified. For example, if it is suspected that there is significant air pollution in a particular area, then uh, environmental epidemiologists or environmental health specialists should tell you what are the public health consequences like respiratory illnesses, cardiovascular illnesses, etc., that can result as a result of exposure to air pollution. Environmental epidemiologists typically start with an assessment of the past, current, or future exposures, which means that they can, uh, they can study an exposure which is right now occurring, or they can model an exposure that may occur in future, or they may, uh, they may study exposure that had occurred in the past and then can model what's gonna happen, what happened in the past, what's gonna happen in future, or what can be a scenario. For example, climate change or climate models that you get to see. Yes. The third thing that is important is to frame testable hypothesis of effects to be studied in specified populations which means that if a certain environmental agent is responsible for a particular health effect, then this is also under the um, purview of an environmental epidemiological study designed in the sense that whether there is a real association or a valid association, that needs to be studied. We'll talk about this and learn about this in the second lecture. And however, because of this, environmental epidemiological studies face several challenges. Typically, the risk estimates are quite low because um, quite often you will not find a large association between an exposure and an outcome. Therefore, epi environmental epidemiological studies typically need large sample sizes and long-term follow-up studies. And uh, many of these things have got long latency period, which means that, you know, from the time of the uh, beginning of the, um, um, of, of the exposure to manifestation of symptoms, they take typically long time. And not everything is a binary. In other words, you know, the disease is present or not present, and um, etc. Et so other health studies are needed as well. How to initiate environmental epidemiological studies? We have already touched this before. That is, the environmental health specialists identify the hazards and then characterize the risk. They identify the exposure and then they identify the dose that enters human bodies and health effects. And that frequently start with identification of clusters of diseases. If many people fall ill at a particular locality over a particular period of time, then that is known as a cluster. And the cluster investigation is quite often the first thing that environmental health specialists do. Once you um, assess the prevalence of the uh, illnesses that is uh, located in a particular geographical area, then you check if it exceeds what is expected of that particular area in that particular period of time. And then from there, um, start an uh, analysis of the exposure data. So we need to now come uh, to an understanding as to what is the difference between hazard and risk. Hazard, of course, is a source of danger. And it's a, it's a likelihood that some health effect is going to take place if somebody is exposed to uh, that particular hazard. For example, if you're exposed to a heavy drift of uh, snowstorm, then it's quite possible that you will end up with... Um, with different kinds of respiratory illnesses or other kinds of diseases. 
So it's quite qualitative, it's potential harm. But risk is the probability or likelihood that that harm will actually take place. So if you're exposed to very, very low temperature, it's quite possible that somebody, some you know, people who are old and uh, frail and elderly may end up with heart disease. But what is the probability of that? How much? If, if, uh, if 1,000 people were exposed to extremely low temperature, what would be their likelihood of being exposed to, um, um, you know, what, what is the likelihood that they have developed heart disease? So that's the kind of thing that is risk, and risk is quantitative. And risk needs to be very effectively communicated to people using uh, simple language and terms. So here are some principles of risk communication that you cannot really assume that everybody will understand your points equally well. And therefore, you need to cater to a wide range of uh, literacy that people have in order to understand and receive messages. One needs to understand what is the society in which, or what is the nature of the society where risk communication needs to be done. And one must use a number of different media. It could be oral communications, lectures, or visual materials, uh, print publications, and electronic documents. We now come to an understanding of two different, two other things that are very, very important, that is exposure dose and health effects. Exposure basically refers to the contact of the agent or environmental factor with human being. So in other words, if it's high temperature or high heat, it's a contact of the, with the skin. Or if it is uh, ultraviolet radiation, quite often you don't really have, uh, that exposure itself is to the entire human being as it is. And dose refers to the amount of exposure that actually enters the human body. For example, if a chemical substance is um, considered to be a cause of harm or cause of a particular disease, say for example, asbestos causes lung cancer, then the amount of asbestos that enters human body in the human blood, or the human system in some way using biomarkers and others, that is important. That is the dose. And the, the, the exposure then leads to the dose. The dose then acts on human systems, alters metabolism, interferes with body systems and functions, and leads to diseases. And the effects could be, for example, local effects. For example, um, a, a skin lesion or skin eruption or burn. It could be systemic. For example, it could lead to heart disease. For example, air pollution and uh, asthma, air pollution and uh, heart disease. It could be an acute condition, for example, it could occur all of a sudden, for example, extreme exposure to arsenic can lead to, um, uh, you know, acute arsenicosis, which means vomiting and um, other kinds of problems. And um, chronic disease is that something that takes over a period of time because people are chronically exposed to this. Some exposures are reversible because when you remove the source of exposure that, you know, people get back to their former selves. Some, some, some exposures are irreversible because when they're exposed to this, you know, the changes that occur, they are pertinent, they're persistent, they do not change back. And as human beings, we move in the, in the context of different exposure levels. So therefore, there's a need to understand the total exposure by summiting the different kinds of exposure level at which we are exposed. Then there are surrogate measures of exposure, or biomarkers, for example, in which you cannot exactly measure the same thing that is present in the environment but a metabolic byproduct, for example. For example, if people are exposed to arsenic, the inorganic arsenic cannot be directly measured in the bloodstream, but uh, urinary inorganic arsenic or methylated versions of arsenic are measured. These are called biomarkers, and these are surrogate measures of exposure. Now, why are environmental epidemiological studies conducted? Quite often, it is because people are interested to establish scientific knowledge about exposure and outcomes. More often, it's quite important to learn from small studies or pilot studies about what's happening locally. In a particular locality, there may be um, a, a concern that certain things are happening, certain exposures are happening, people are falling sick, so investigations are done. Um, sometimes clusters emerge, so that need to be investigated. So that's why uh, environmental epidemiological studies are, con are conducted. Sometimes community members are concerned that they have detected a cluster of diseases, and so the health department are alerted and therefore then uh, investigations ensue. As we uh, talked about previously, that there are certain challenges that environmental epidemiological studies face, that is difficult to find variability across geographic or spatial zones because you know things are very similar. The effect size may be small, people move from one region to another, and therefore they move from one exposure zone to another. Sometimes that can dilute the impact of, um, of, the, um, of the effect studies, effect estimates in epidemiological studies. 
quite often more than one exposure will complicate the emergence of health effects. So you cannot really pinpoint only to one exposure, but you have to study more than one exposure. One of the important principles of environmental health and environmental health epidemiological studies is environmental health risk assessment. And this is a four-step process. In the first step, you identify the hazard that is important. We have already discussed what hazard is. It is the potential that something is going to be harmful to human health. And then there is a two-step process in which people assess the exposure and then conduct a dose response um, assessment. That is, they assess as a dose increases in human context, whether the health effects also correspondingly increase or what happens to dose, uh, what happens to human, um, um, human effect. And on the basis of the dose response assessment and the exposure assessment as to how much exposure a person is, um, is, is, is suffering from and uh, what is the characteristic of the dose, of that dose to the response, um, it, is it is important to um, estimate a, 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 and characterize the risk that entails. And that characterized risk will then be used to um, go back again to the, to, to the hazard and see um, which hazard needs to be um, identified and how that needs to be controlled which is the second uh, way. So what is a dose response curve? Dose response curve is a curve where we see how the response or health effect changes with increasing dosage of the environmental agent. It's almost always as you increase the dose of the environmental agent that changes. And one of the things uh, that is important is this, that many people assume that dose response curve is going to be linear, but it is not always linear. So take a look at this. Um, it's the next graph and you'll see what I mean by this. And they're quite often impacted by age, gender, and other variables that are present in the people who are exposed to this. On the left of, uh, of this curve, you see that there is a linear dose-response relationship. So as the dose increases linearly, the impact of the health effect also increases. Whereas on the right side, you see that initially as the dose increases, the health impact does not um, affect that much. But after a certain amount of dose or certain uh, threshold level, which is marked by A, um, is reached or exceeded, then the, um, the health effects increase rapidly and linearly. And then again, after a, uh, another threshold, that is B, is reached, then the effect again drops off. So this kind of a curve is known as a sigmoid curve. It's not exactly a linear curve. So uh, this is something that needs to be kept in mind, that sometimes it is not a linear relationship. Lastly, we are going to come and learn a little bit about what is known as environmental health management, because one of the things which is important about environmental epidemiological studies and, um, um, and environmental health is that we need to manage those risks. And frameworks are very useful because frameworks enable us to, um, to um, get a bigger picture of the entire problem and help us solve these problems. A very popular um, uh, environmental health uh, risk management framework is deep sea management, D-P-S-W-E-A. The D stands for driving forces for different exposure levels. So say for example if it is air pollution you know the air pollution what are the what are some of the factors that cause air pollution for example establishment of a factory vehicular traffic uh, etc um, forest fire what does uh, uh, then then the second thing that we discuss is p which is the pressure that this combined exposure exert on the environment which means that they alter say for example the um, the particulate matter um, content of the um, of the air so that's another important thing if the particular matter of the air um, is, is, is changed, what, what happens to the air quality? Well, the air quality or the state of the air quality changes, which means that quite often visibility changes, ground visibility changes that are picked up by satellites, for example, or, um, or air, aircraft radars. So when that happens, the exposure, uh, you know, there's, there's higher exposure of contaminated air or polluted air to the environment. And then that leads to certain health effects. And so what kind of actions we can take to mitigate each of these things, which is explained by the deep sea framework graphic here. You can see that, you know, we can do uh, many different things at many different levels to change these things. So in this particular module, we learned what is environment in environmental health. We learned the role of environmental epidemiology in environmental health, how we can conduct environmental health risk assessment and how we can mitigate um, some of the environmental health risk. So this completes the first module. Thank you.